I study how a doctor's brain thinks. And in particular, what I study is what goes on inside your doctor's mind when you walk in with a symptom and you walk out with a diagnostic label. To be clear, we've actually had uh, computers in the diagnosis business, I'd say for about 30 years or so. Um, and they're good, but they're not great. And the problem with them is that they're not intelligent. So I can type in some of the symptoms that you have and it can give me a checklist of possibilities, but it misses the mark. It doesn't give me what I need. It sort of gives me a combination of the blatantly obvious and it gives me the blatantly wrong. But what I really need that computer to do is give me something in the middle, something, a nudge to think of a good idea that I didn't, but I should have. And of course, we have computers who can think that way already. That exists. You know that every day that you check out on Amazon, it gives you a couple suggestions at the end where you're like, you know, I didn't think about that, but yeah, that's a good idea. I think I should do that. So if you walk into clinic and you have chest pain and I'm typing it up and I say, don't worry about it, it's just heartburn. And I'm typing and the computer's reading and it might say, hey, you know, doc, doctors who like heartburn also liked heart attack or heart palpitations. <laughs> and if we got a computer that could think that way, if we got a computer that could be that smart, that would make your diagnosis and your healthcare safer and more effective. But for the time being, it's just seemed like to us that that is only accessible to Amazon and Netflix and Pandora, but somehow that kind of predictive analytic thinking has been out of touch for medicine. But that started to change a few years ago. And the story starts back in 1997. That's when IBM's supercomputer, Deep Blue, beat the reigning world champion in chess, the grandmaster Gary Kasparov. And if anyone is around, you will remember it was the most celebrated man versus machine battle of the 21st century. But 10, 20 years later, IBM set out on this task again and they said, we need to make a bigger splash. We have to go after something bigger and broader. So who they set their sights on was Ken Jennings. Ken Jennings is Jeopardy's most winningest champion ever. He was the target that they wanted to go after. But what they had to do to do that was get their new supercomputer called Watson into the winner's cloud. And the winner's cloud is this graph, this scatter plot of the greatest Jeopardy champions. So when they loaded up Watson with all of the state-of-the-art algorithms that we had and gave it Wikipedia and the best that the internet had to offer, this is the performance that they got. One of the biggest hurdles that we face if we're trying to make a computer smart is making it understand plain old common sense. When humans talk back and forth and communicate with each other, we have this vast network and background of unspoken assumptions that, that lubricates every single conversation that we have. If you tell me that your arm hurts, there's an unspoken assumption that humans wanna be out of pain. But a computer doesn't know that. You have to program that. If I tell you that I'm sad, there's an unspoken assumption that humans wanna be happy but a computer doesn't know that either, so you have to program that as well. But if you want the computer to understand why someone is sleepy after working a double shift, or why it's unusual for a marathoner to be short of breath after he walks up a hill, but not unusual for a couch potato, then it has to know way more than medicine. It has to know about life itself. And that's a real problem because the computer has never lived life. And that means you have to program every single thing about life into it. You have to teach it that milk is white, that rain is wet, that a mother always loves her child, and that there's two type of Apple products in a world. You have to teach every one of those things to a computer if you want it to be intelligent. Take a look at this screen. What do you see? A's. You see A's. You see 20 A's to be precise. And that happened in the blink of an eye. In an instant, your brain recognized it. It turns out it is nearly impossible for a computer to do that on its own. But as it turns out, even though we can't write the rule, the computer can learn what the letter A is through trial and error itself, and it can write the rule for itself, and that's called machine learning. And what you do when you're faced with a problem like the letter A is that you feed it one A, then 10 A's, then 100 A's, here's an R, that's not an A, and then a 10,000th A. And what the computer will do is just filter out all the irregularities and variation and figure out the constant feature and write the rule for itself. So that even though we can't program the computer, it will go on to program itself. So the key to giving a computer smarts isn't giving it facts, it's giving it experience, just like our brain accumulates in real life. And it turns out that's what the engineers at IBM had to do. They couldn't just feed Watson the world of knowledge. They had to feed it tens of thousands of Jeopardy questions with a tightly linked 
question and answer. And there it turns out there's a database that does that. There is something called the J Archive, which has 30 years of Jeopardy questions online. It's up to about 230,000 right now. And that's what Watson learned from. And you might think, well, that sounds great. If we have big data, then we can just teach computers about medicine in the exact same way. But the issue is that Watson had access to that beautiful J Archive. And in medicine, Dr. Watson will have access to this. <laughs> So if you want Watson to solve the problems of real life, that means it's gonna to have to learn from real life. And that means its textbook is gonna to have to be doctor's notes. This may seem like it's an insurmountable obstacle, that if there's too many rules of life and we ourselves aren't aware of them, and all those things I just told you you aren't aware of, those all resided in your subconscious until we talk about them, that we may not be able to make a computer smart. But it turns out that we actually can draw inspiration from our brain itself. Because the brain, it turns out, gets smart by two ways. You can either write the recipe for intelligence, that's what we try to do in school, or you can let the intelligence grow for itself. And that's what turns out to be the key to building a smart computer. It's a human business legacy we want to leave behind us.